Welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, now we have the pleasure of uh, hearing from uh, Dr. Bickel, who I've worked with as part of the ITC project. And um, in that work, uh, what uh, I found uh, Dr. Bickel's work particularly interesting and useful because they actually involve participants in making decisions about policies that uh, for which we may not have good information and even considering the um, interaction between different policies uh, implemented at various levels. So uh, uh, Dr. Bickel, why don't you take it away and tell us more about uh, your work? Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks everyone for being here. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us, and I'd like to acknowledge my collaborator, Roberto Limos. Uh, these are my disclosures. Although I work with these companies, I will discuss neither them nor any of their products in this presentation. So tobacco control would benefit from estimates of the impact of new policies and products. Empirical estimates of the effects of a new regulation or tobacco product or different tobacco products on consumption and substitution might be useful to understanding the impact of these policies. We developed an experimental method to examine the dynamic tobacco marketplace and potentially forecast the effects of new products and policies. We call it the experimental tobacco marketplace. Briefly, how we sort of organize these studies it is um, we take cigarette smokers and other tobacco users, we've endowed them with as much money as they typically spend on their tobacco products. We then put them into a Amazon-like interface, such as you see here, we, where we control all the products, all the price, prices and conditions of their availability. They'll then work through several potential scenarios, one of which will be randomly selected and, imp and, and uh, actually um, made to come true, the subject will walk away with those products and any unspent money that we had allocated to them. Um, and then typically we follow up with them later and they can return any unused product and get compensated for the return of those products. What we're interested in are measures of elasticity, both intensity and uh, demand elasticity as indicated in the upper panel, the sensitivity of a product to price and also substitution. And in this sense, we're talking about economic substitution. As we increase price of a conventional product, do we see a product that remains at a constant price show increases? That would indicate a degree of substitution and we can measure that degree. So why a complex experimental tobacco marketplace? Well, the type and number of products in the marketplace alters demand elasticity and substitution. So uh, this is an old study we did with old methods, but it illustrates the key point. In this um, study where uh, people were able to uh, respond to different prices to get uh, standard conventional cigarettes, and we got a demand curve when it was alone. We got a demand curve for conventional cigarettes when gum was uh, nicotine gum was concurrently available at a constant price. Um, Again, we in, and then we introduce a denicotinized cigarette, which is, today would be called a very uh, low nicotine containing cigarette. And then we put all these products together. And the degree of substitution cannot be predicted by examination of these products alone or, in or uh, just as pairs. Um, making the point again that the type and number of products in the marketplace alters the elasticity and substitution profiles. Just uh, one more sort of method slide. So the way we do these studies for in-person laboratory studies, we'll do an assessment session. We'll expose people to the product uh, that they may not be familiar with, or maybe several products. Um, then they engage in ETM session, experimental tobacco marketplace, uh, under several scenarios. One will come true. They'll walk away with the product that they can use in their real world environment, and then we'll follow up with them. We can repeat the cycle several times if we needed to for a given experiment. I'd like to talk today about uh, uh, five studies aggregated into two 
areas, uh, increasing cigarette price and looking at policy changes, which will include a nicotine concentration of vaping products, an integrated tax policy solution to the highly heterogeneous tax policies that we currently have in the United States, as well as um, some research we've done more recently on the legal purchasing. We've created a parallel market to the uh, experimental tobacco marketplace, which we have deemed the illegal marketplace where you can buy things that are not available in the legal marketplace. And we can look at the conditions that may engender illegal purchasing. Let's look at um, nicotine concentration as a vaping product in the experimental tobacco marketplace. This was done uh, using within subject design, a very robust design for with 25 smokers. We looked at a variety of different e-liquid strengths from zero to 24 milligrams per ml. And then we varied the price of conventional cigarettes across five prices. Here's the data that resulted from this experiment. And if I draw your attention first to panel B on the right-hand side, here we're looking at the, uh, the milligrams of nicotine purchase as a function of increasing price of conventional cigarettes. So this is the substitution profile here. And you see very nice dose related increases in the degree and um, amount of nicotine purchased as we increase the uh, strength of the e-liquid. These dose effects have been highly replicable in numerous studies over and over again. And the fact that we can demonstrate in the experimental tobacco marketplace adds uh, some internal and external validity to our studies. On the uh, other side of the panel, panel A, we're looking at the effects of increasing price on cigarette consumption when these different e-liquid concentrations were available. And we can see that there was marginal impact of the e-liquid being currently available, um, but there is a, a great effect of price. Once again, replicating over and over again uh, what we've seen in so many other places that price is an important determiner of cigarette and other product consumption. The fact that um, we did not alter cigarette consumption or demand or purchasing um, suggests that collectively participants in this study may have been exposed to greater uh, total nicotine. So to conclude, cigarette purchasing decreased as a function of cigarette price. E-liquid purchasing increased as a function of both cigarette price and e-liquid strength. And the 24 milligram e-liquid appears to function as a better substitute. Let's look at integrated tax policies. I don't have to tell anyone here that uh, tax policies are highly heterogeneous across states and also nationally. Uh, and um, several have suggested potential integrated tax policy approaches. Here with an uh, online study conducted within subject, we looked at tobacco parity and harm reduction taxes. Tobacco parity tax would impose a higher tax equally on all tobacco products with no tax levied on medicinal nicotine or cessation products. The overall arching goal is to encourage cessation of all tobacco purchasing. Now, this has been promulgated by the World Health Organization Tobacco-Free Initiative and the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. The harm reduction tax proposal would levy taxes in proportion to the product's level of harm with the goal to transition tobacco users away from the most harmful products. This has been promulgated by Frank Chalupka and Ken Warner in, in uh, uh, their papers and by several other groups. Um, so here we had um, within subject, 35 subject, purchasing across six multiplicative tax factors. Here's the primary data for this study. What we're looking at is quantity purchase as a function of tax increases. Uh, we had three tax tiers in both groups different products in those tiers. In the tax parity, we had all um, tobacco products in the high tax tier. We had uh, no nicotine containing products that um, in the uh, mid tax tier and medicinal nicotine in the low tax tier. In the harm reduction, we had a combustible products in the highest tax tier and followed by non-combustible tobacco products in the middle tier and then uh, medicinal nicotine at the lowest tier. What we can see with tobacco parity is that increases in taxes decreased uh, the consumption of tobacco products or the quantity purchased. And at the higher tax levels, 
increased medicinal nicotine. Uh, conversely, the harm reduction, while also showing tax related decreases in combustible tobacco products, showed uh, increases in the medium tax tier quantity purchased and to a lesser extent, medicinal nicotine. Interestingly, if we looked at the quantity, the total amount of nicotine purchased, there was no difference between these uh, two conditions. Uh, although they clearly show the effects of the taxes. This uh, supports the, uh, the, uh, the uh, finding that's been seen over and over again, that nicotine is regulated among cigarette smokers. So uh, tobacco parity decreased purchasing of all tobacco products. Tobacco parity increased purchasing of medicinal nicotine. Conversely, harm reduction, although seeing the decrease in purchasing of combustible products, showed greater purchases of ends and, and smokeless tobacco. Total uh, nicotine was not different between these two uh, integrated tax proposals. Let's move to the illegal experimental tobacco marketplace. Of course, many of us are aware that illicit trade in tobacco products is ongoing. Uh, these products are available via internet purchase. One of the challenges, these products may contain adulterants not found in commercial products. And the efficacy of mitigation strategies to prevent illicit purchasing is unknown. And generally, there's an absence of empirical models. So we created essentially a parallel marketplace where you can buy what's not available in the legal marketplace to examine this issue. So let's look at a reduced nicotine standard for cigarettes. This was an online study. The participants did not get exposure to the, the very low nicotine tank cigarettes, but they read a scenario where we said uh, that for this purpose of this experiment, the FDA has approved the use of the very low nicotine containing cigarette and conventional cigarettes are no longer available. The very low nicotine containing cigarette would produce a less, substantially less satisfaction. And then we looked at uh, marketplace preferences, but they choose to buy from the licit market or the illicit market. Here we see the key findings. We're looking at the probability of choosing the illegal market as a function of price of the legal cigarette. In the very low nicotine containing uh, cigarette condition, we're increasing the price of the very low nicotine containing cigarette in the legal market. And we're seeing um, uh, very nice price related increases in uh, illegal purchasing, more so than when conventional cigarettes are also available in the legal market. Indeed, the only time we see um, interest in the illegal market is when the price in the licit market and the legal market are roughly comparable, which was two times market price. So, um, for this experiment, price and product standards can alter substitutability between the legal and illegal marketplace and products. Next, we want to investigate in this uh, same arrangement, vaping bans. In this first uh, experiment, we looked at 150 online smokers, e-cigarette users, and dual users. Um, we looked at no ban, a complete vaping ban and a flavored vaping ban. We also examined the effects of monetary fines for purchasing in the illicit market. Here's our key findings. We're looking at the predicted probability of choosing the illicit, uh, the illegal marketplace for cigarette smokers, dual users, and e-cigarette users in these three panels under the three conditions, vaping ban, flavored vaping ban, and no ban. In each of these conditions, we're increasing the price of legal cigarettes, while the other products are remaining at a constant price. First off, you can see that the rank order of these conditions is comparable across all three groups. The cigarette smokers and the dual users show sensitivity to a cigarette price. As cigarette price increases, there's greater um, likelihood of purchasing from the illicit marketplace. The e-cigarette users conversely, are insensitive to the effects of cigarette price. Perhaps that might be expected. But what we're seeing here is that the vaping ban produces nearly unity in the likelihood of, of these smokers 
purchasing from the illegal marketplace. If we look at the effects of fines across these three groups, we can see that there's a fine dependent effect. As fines increases, there's less likelihood of purchasing from the legal market. However, the e-cigarette users are least sensitive to the effects of that manipulation, as shown in panel C, where we compare the elasticity of demand for the illicit market. The e-cigarette users are different than the dual users and cigarette users. Um, 10 minutes till the next presentation. Thank you. So the ban, uh, bans increase illegal purchases. The exclusive e-cigarette smokers show the largest effect. Increasing cigarette price increased illegal purchasing, particularly among exclusive cigarette users and dual users. The vaping ban was uh, had greater illegal purchases than the flavor ban. And monetary fines suppressed illegal purchasing but the exclusive e-cigarette users were the most resistant. In our last experiment, we looked, we uh, extended that study I just described to you to the ITC project, where we looked at 452 smokers, e-cigarette users, and dual users from the United States, Canada, and England. In addition to the no ban vaping ban and total flavor ban, we also included a partial flavor ban in this experiment. The partial flavor ban uh, permitted the use of menthol. And once again, we looked at the market preference for the legal or uh, the illegal market. Now, uh, this is uh, these three panels are set up just like the panels I showed you before. We're looking at the probability of choosing the legal market for cigarette smokers, dual users, and e-cigarette users, a function of cigarette price in England in the left-hand panel, United States in the middle panel, and in Canada in the right-hand panel. And you can see the conditions on the bottom, no ban, partial flavor ban, total flavor ban, and e-cigarette ban. Overall, across all three countries, we see uh, the same general rank order of the impact of these different conditions in gendering illicit purchases. However, we also see some clear country differences. We think this is interesting. It shows on the one hand that we can uh, get generalizable results from our, our more basic laboratory arrangement to broader groups of individuals across different countries, but can also be sensitive to local environments. So um, to conclude this overall presentation, uh, the, ET, the experimental tobacco marketplace assesses policy impact of tobacco product demand and substitution. As, as I think we've shown, it can be adapted to address a variety of questions of relevance to tobacco control. It assesses, it can, we can assess the generality of policy across different countries. And we think it could be a useful tool to, to, for tobacco control, regulatory science, and for modeling of future policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wickham. So I see we have uh, Ken's uh, hands up, and there's also a question by Jamie Temp. So, Ken, could you unmute? Um, sure. Yeah, yeah please uh, go ahead. Great talk, Warren. This is really interesting work, and I think it's very important. And the consistency that you find with the other kinds of evidence is also very important. One thing I missed, uh, just because you were going through these fairly quickly, sure. when you're looking at the demand curve for cigarettes uh, and the demand curve for alternatives like e-cigarettes or something, and you're doing the taxation schemes where you have identical taxes or they try to tax them comparably, and then the one where you have a lower tax for the ends product. Yes. What, what happens to the overall demand for cigarettes at any given price? So when we have the differential taxation, do we see a greater decrease in demand at any given price or a con no change or what? So um, if I can um, share again, just to show, go, jump to that figure, I think that would be most helpful. 
Um, um, but um, maybe I can't do it. <laughs> we, are, we're, we can see your slides. OK, well, let me share again. Um, uh, beautiful. Um, uh, can you see them? I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 okay. we're seeing it. Just Very good. So, um, so these were all conventional cigarette smokers. So although we had um, these other products in the category, they were primarily using um, uh, conventional cigarettes. What we did see um, at the initial tax increases, the move away from premium to more generic cigarettes. And then you, then, um, you can see at what point um, they finally sort of give up and start purchasing alternative products, right? Um, so it, it varied by the, the type of tax condition and what the alternatives are. Um, clearly with the harm reduction, there was an earlier transition to um, the products that we had in the mid tax tier. Uh, and since there was no really nicotine available in the tax tobacco parity uh, condition, um, it took a little bit longer and then we start uh, more transition to the uh, medicinal nicotine. Great. So you, the point being, you are showing substitution, and with the differential pricing, the demand curve is actually lower uh, when you have the harm reduction schema. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That that's that's really important to know. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for your question. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Uh, right, Karan, could you could you unmute? Yes. Please? Hi. Thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Uh, I have questions about what kind of information respondents receive about the illegal illegal market. I, I I noticed that you mentioned there were some fines, but I'm wondering if there are any other, like to the respondent, are there any perceived negative consequences? Um, to purchasing through the Ill illegal market, or um, are there any kind of barriers to accessing that illegal market? That is, you know, it, there's some kind of inconvenience associated with purchasing on the illegal market. And I'm so I, I, any more context around how the illegal market is introduced to the respondent would be helpful. Sure. Um, so, for, so first off, um, these were our initial exp our experiments. The number of things that we could potentially manipulate are innumerable. So, for example, uh, we could we could put in a delay to receipt. We could um, put a probability that the product that you purchase is not actually the product that you receive in the illicit market, which I'm sure is a risk, or that the quality of the product is less. Um, so, those things are potentially manipulable. What we've done in in these conditions is just extra, exp explain as an illicit market. Uh, that has all the risk associated with a listed market purchase. We did um, in a subsequent experiment, which I didn't present the data here, we uh, uh, asked people about if they purchased, um, how, what would be their, we, we did the profile of negative mood states and we increased uh, under the condition we said, what would happen if you got caught? Uh, we increase the purport their their response and the increase of negative mood states, right? So we take that um, that the concept of buying from legal market is not without consequence for the consumer. Of course, that could be amplified in any of these contexts as well by saying, you know, you be uh, you become uh, known to the authorities as a illegal purchaser. Your name could be put on a public website. We, we, these are all manipulable variables. And that's what uh, we love about the experimental tobacco marketplace. It is robust in the number of things that we can explore. Um, and the only thing that's thwarting us is um, our own creativity. 